Welcome to the Bad Roman Podcast, where we talk with veterans, community leaders, and Christians and non-Christians as we explore the entanglement of Christians with the state. The Bad Roman Project was created out of the firm belief that as Christians, we are called to follow Christ, not the state. Here is your host, Craig Hargis. Hey, folks. Today, we're going to try something a little different. I think it's going to be a lot of fun. We're going to do what is called an anarchist roundtable from a Christian perspective, where we're going to start with a topic and just kind of go from there, kind of freestyle after that. And any future uh, anarchist roundtables, we're, we're hoping the listeners will send us topic ideas that you'd like to hear us discuss. So if you have a topic idea, reach out to us on our website or at the Bad Roman Podcast at gmail.com. We'd love to hear from you and hope you enjoy this. Today's topic is going to be, how would you respond to a Christian that believes that the state is necessary to protect our liberties? And before we get started, I'd like to introduce everybody that's a part of this today. Scott Goldman, John D'Angelo, and Abby Kleckner, who all contribute to the Bad Roman blog, and Jessica Green, who is a podcast host for the appropriately named Jessica Green Show. Why don't you start, Jessica, give us a little bit of a background of yourself, and then we'll go to John, Scott, and then Abby to tell us about themselves when we get started. Well, uh, thanks for having me on, first of all. And then uh, secondly, I uh, have a podcast, Jessica Green Show, and maybe the slightly interesting thing about me is that I actually used to be a progressive leftist and an atheist. And over the last, I don't know, two or three years or so, that has shifted dramatically. A lot of my ideas have changed. I um, was once pro-choice, now I'm pro-life. So um, I have found a lot of the anarchic and Christian arguments to be very well thought out. And um, as a result, they have changed my mind. Awesome. Scott, go ahead and tell us about yourself. Um, I'm a self-employed carpenter, um, so a small business owner. Um, it doesn't really give me any, I want to say, any uh, qualifications on the things that we're going to be talking about, but I'm a human. I'm a thinker, and I have been navigating through society since I was a kid. Um, and I think just going through life and having your eyes open no matter what your background is, who you are, um, there's things to learn, and there's things that you can teach. And I think that just gives every everyday person who is paying attention a voice to kind of make decisions and, and things that are going on in today's world. Awesome. John? Hi, thanks for having me. Uh, I'm John. I'm a former Marine combat veteran. I now run the anti-war war vet page. Uh, I've been a Christian for seven years, and um, I'm an anarchist. Abby? Hello. Um, I am an accountant. I specialize in small e-commerce businesses, so I spend all of my time on a computer. Um, <laughs> helping out small business owners, which I think is really cool. So I, I'm very pro-capitalism. Um, and I I think that lines up really well with kind of how the kingdom of God is set up, that uh, we're all individuals and we're all out here to be serving each other, to figure out what each other's needs are, and that we all have an individual role to play. So that's kind of my thing. Um, I am also have been married for a long time and have three boys and live in the Rocky Mountains of Colorado. All right, so let's get started. We already discussed the topic about answering a Christian who believes that the state is necessary to protect our liberties, and we voted for Jessica to start us out. Go ahead, Jessica. <laughs> um, yeah, so I haven't been a Christian for very long, so I think that it's something I should kind of start off with right off the bat was that I'm not a theological scholar. There are probably people who have a much more in-depth reading of the Bible and understanding of the Christian religion than I do. So I'm just kind of giving my perspective. Um, one thing that I thought about when you posed this question to me, like, how would you talk to a Christian who believes in the state when you're a Christian who doesn't? And I always bring things back to the Bible if I can, because it's my only experience. I didn't grow up in the church. I didn't grow up surrounded by theological thinking. So everything that I know comes from the Bible itself. And one thing I hear talked about a lot, especially in anarcho-Christian circles, is uh, the passages of 1 Samuel 8, where Samuel is growing old and has appointed his sons to be judges. And they're not 
righteous men. They're corrupt and all of these things. And so they, the, the Jews come to him and say, we would like a king. And this is very disconcerting to Samuel, who prays about it. And God basically tells him, you know, it's not that the people are rejecting you. They're rejecting me. And they're rejecting me in favor of a king. And God goes on to basically describe what the qualities of a king are. And it's sort of mind-boggling when you read it. I think it starts in um, Samuel uh, 8, 10 through like, 22 and he's listing these qualities of what a king would be like if you guys want a king so bad this is what a king will be like and um i have it pulled up here i'm not going to read the whole thing but he says he will take your sons and make them serve with chariots and horses some he will assign to be commanders and of thousands and commanders of fifties uh he will steal your land he will make your daughters into perfumers cooks and bakers um he will take a tenth of your grain and the list goes on and on and on and as I'm reading this, of course, um, some of these things need to be translated up into modern times, such as, you know, he will take a tenth of your grain. But this is very similar to what our government does now. And it's kind of uncanny because at the end of it, Samuel, you know, he heard what the people wanted and God told him, listen to them and give them a king and that they will learn for themselves what the qualities of a king are. And they will cry out for, you know, they will lament about this king that they have and they will cry for me. And on that day, I'm not going to answer them. And that's what it actually says in Samuel. And that to me is so uncanny because it's so applicable to the state that we have now and how basically the state has the power to take our grain and take our sons and um, put them in chariots. We don't have chariots anymore, but, you know, you can translate that up to modern military equipment. All of the same things that were going on thousands of years ago, it's the same story. We're still looking for leaders to guide us. We're still looking for um, leadership in all the wrong places. Uh, just to that point, um, when we talk to Christians, particularly who believe that the state has a legitimate role in adjudicating issues between individuals or business or the environment or whatever, I think it's important, first and foremost, um, in the same vein that Jessica's talking here, is to kind of shed our paradigms about um, where the government's role is and how we individually view its functions and instead try to imagine um, sort of the objective, tangible results of what we see. And it doesn't have to be the U.S., but I think the U.S. is a, a perfect example of a state that's lost its initial sense of duty and, it, and its initial direction and instead try to imagine um, what life could be life with God-centered living. And so we see the results of the U.S. government, whether it be through like military adventurism or through um, mismanagement of various aspects of the economy. And I think it gives us some real insight into the failings of the government, even on um, sort of just pragmat in a pragmatic sense. We don't necessarily have to even make the Christian argument or the anti-government argument right away, except to just to try to point people towards where we see these major gaps. And um, what God is speaking to when trying to assure Samuel is that um, these gaps are sort of inevitable and the only place, the only refuge where we wouldn't have those is, is under God himself. Yeah, actually, to play off both of that, I think there's very good uh, biblical evidence um, when we look at those stories of Samuel, um, God being rejected through Samuel and the people asking for a king. Um, it only takes three kings before all those prophecies uh, come true, and that comes in Solomon. And if you go back to Deuteronomy, you look at all the warnings in there, um, we meet those by the time we hit Solomon and first Kings chapter 10 is a really good, like if you read it really, really closely, you have the queen of Sheba um, telling Sol Solomon that God has given you all this wealth, all this glory for the good of the people. And then it goes on to list what Solomon's doing. And Solomon is building his city up. He builds a temple to the Lord 
he has 666 like tons of gold coming in um and then you break all those things down and you notice that solomon builds a temple to the lord using uh, how did I say it not slave labor is how they worded it but forced labor is how they word it a lot of times in the bible but it's the same as slave labor what that chapter is telling us israel chose kings and by the third king this solomon is the new pharaoh where generations just before the god who freed slaves is now having a temple built to him by slaves there's a big there's a big twist in the story of israel where they instead of following God, they followed the nations. And that's what we have done as Christians, in my opinion, is we have laid down our responsibilities to love one another as ourselves and to make sure that our neighbor is doing well. Like the first question, in the uh, one of the first questions in the Bible in the story of Cain and Abel is, am I my brother's keeper? Well, the answer is obviously yes, if we're paying attention to that story. Since we've diverted from this and we've decided, decided to rule over one another, instead of support one another, I think this is where we as Christians have lost our way just like Israel. That theme of wanting to be like all the other nations comes up in so many different stories. You know, God repeatedly tells us that we're not meant to be like this world and that the more we try to sort of emulate ourselves after other nations, the more problems we're going to have. And you definitely see that like history is a long proof positive of all of these things. Like we keep um, repeating the same stories over and over again, which is kind of funny, like that we haven't learned all this time and we haven't learned that being like the other nations is not working out for us. <laughs> yeah, I guess the, the thing that I think about is uh, through, throughout all of the history of Israel, they were waiting for the Messiah and they expected him to be a political leader who was going to... Um, unify their nation again and deliver them from oppression. They had been ruled over by so many other nations. And then when Jesus came, he was totally not what they expected because he was completely apolitical and not a military leader and had no interest in any kind of political power at all. And you see in his um, temptation in the desert that one of the things that Satan tempts him with is all the kingdoms of the world, that he could have political power which points out the interesting thing that that was Satan's power to give. And that also that Jesus wanted no part of that. And I think if we're to be followers of Christ, we have to follow that example too. Um, he came to bring God's kingdom, which would have absolutely nothing to do with the kingdoms of the world. So I think a lot of times Christians think, well, uh, if we have more Christians in leadership, if Christians are more involved in politics, then we can, uh, bring God's kingdom through that way. We we can fix things. We can stop abortion. We can help poor people. You know, you name it. People think that. Um, I mean, basically, that the government's a magic wand that can fix all our problems. But what Jesus's obvious example was is that that is the kingdoms of this world are top down, and His kingdom is bottom up, where individuals are choosing to serve each other, to really love each other. And that is the way that we're going to bring, you know, peace and, and God's kingdom to the world, not through political power, which the only tool of the kingdoms of this world is violence when it comes down to it. That's interesting that you say that because in this uh, back and forth message that we were having on the, the, the Facebook page, I mentioned to him, I said, you know, Jesus never instructed us to spread the gospel with government force. Yeah. And he agreed with me and he said, we don't use government to spread the gospel, but we use government to protect Christians from being murdered and persecuted for spreading the gospel. I don't, I don't know that government has any interest in protecting us if uh, we're spreading the gospel. I don't think they have any interest in protecting us at all. What do you all have to say about that? Um, we're not supposed to be aligned with the kingdoms of the world. I mean, I, I look at a lot of the Old Testament as allegorical. And if you see where Israel is coming into the promised land, they are like not supposed to be united with these people. It's because their values are not the same. And I think that's a, a definitely a metaphysical truth that we need to take, um, that the world doesn't operate like the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven cannot be in intermingled 
um, with the kingdoms of the world. Those are all hierarchy systems that if you don't do what you're told, you're you're punished in some way. Um, and I have to say, like this point in history, we were punished a heck of a lot less than, say, the days of Exodus. But it's still a model of the world where Christ put that totally upside down, where he even washes the feet of Judas. And that's one of the things we have to take to heart is we don't want government protection because our witness to do the right thing, if it meets violent ends, that's our testimony to the greatness, just as Christ was put on the cross. And the thing that I can't be home um, enough is that it was not atheists and not um, anarchists who put Christ on the cross. It was law and order with the aligned with religion. So we have to be really careful of these systems. Like I am very much a skeptic of even my own, evangelical tradition that I'm so immersed in. Um, even though I don't think like them anymore and I kind of have a different theology, this is still my my group. This is where I came out of. And I can't leave it because I it's like trying to imagine Jesus just not speaking to Israel at all and going to speak to other people. You have to start with the people that you know and where you come from, um, but also to have some distance. And that distance is actually just the truth. You know, you have to stand the ground on what the truth is. And the truth is we cannot change this world by violence. We can only change this world positively by loving one another. If there's ever a war drum I'll beat, it's that. Yeah, I, I think that there's a lot of truth there that actually bears out in history. Being a student of history myself, I look at um, the, the conquering of the Vikings. The Vikings were, uh, the, and of course, that's a broad term, but were a very strong military force who were coming in on the English Isles and were unable to conquer them, not through military might, but because they were Christianized. The The Christians of the English Isles did not militarily defeat the Vikings. They Christianized them, and the Vikings themselves became Christians. And so it wasn't through the force of an army that this, uh, you know, raiding and pillaging finally ended. It was through the truth of Christianity finding their way to these people. And that ended the violence of the raiding of the Vikings on the English Isles. So you can see little pockets of history over and over and over again where um, Christianity was not brought by force. It, it was actually like a social movement that ended up changing people not through the, yeah. the might of the sword. Yeah, that's great, Jessica. I mean, I think in that, in that same vein with the example of um, the Vikings, we see a Christian movement that's submissive and content in their lot and professing the gospel as Christ would have. And I think oftentimes, and especially since the Enlightenment and um, the development of these really powerful Western countries that are all at least ostensibly Christian and professing Christian um, values and um, putting up Christian leaders, we see the fruit of the counterexample being these Western countries. Instead of being submissive and content, helping your neighbor and loving and trying to spread the gospel, we have been murdering image bearers all across the world for um, all sorts of geopolitical aims. And this is not unique to the U.S. and it's not unique um, to any large Anglo um, empire. This has been the story every time we tried to, as Christians, put our values onto a, the platform of a government and then export it in that way. Um, it doesn't work that way because just as Abby had said earlier, government is by its very nature coercive and violent. And that's that often makes people rankle and makes people uncomfortable to hear. Um, but I, I think there's really obvious object lessons to be had. I mean, a taxation is an easy one. Conscription is another one where we consider the idea of giving up our income or giving up our children um, to a state willingly. We, there's a reason that this is done compulsively, and it's because people wouldn't do it otherwise. And that single fact about the way that government operates should be cluing us as professing Christians who are interested in serving the kingdom of God and advancing the kingdom of God here on earth, that uh, we aren't being good stewards of our faith by putting our faith instead in, in man-made governments. Um, I think it's much more wise to take the anarchist position of nonviolence and of mutual cooperation, uh, whether it be socialist or capitalist or whatever, because it, it puts the onus on the individual 
uh, whether a faithful person or not, to to live those values and to advocate for those values in spheres that they can control instead of these giant bureaucracies that are, I think, at this point, everyone can agree are outside of our control. Yeah. So just, yeah, taking it back to kind of like the practical and the real world, if we're talking about um, how we talk to people who are Christians who believe in the state, usually when I have a conversation with someone, I like to ask more questions than like, I don't know, grandstand. <laughs> and I, I find when you're asking people a lot of questions, um, almost everybody has a lot more complaints about government than they have praise. There, there's way more that they think is done wrong than is done right. Um, and I think it comes to, I, this is not my idea. I cannot for the life of me remember where I read this, but whoever it is, I'm stealing your idea that government is a unicorn and so much of people's time is spent arguing, well, the the unicorn's horn should be shaped like this, or no, the unicorn's horn should be shaped like that, or the unicorn's mane should be pink, or no, it should be purple, or no, it should be rainbow colored. And really, you have to get down to the bottom line of unicorns aren't real. <laughs> <laughs> so... <laughs> You can argue that, oh, the government should protect our liberties. Oh, the government should do this. The government should do that. You're talking about something that doesn't actually exist. What we actually have is a government that steals from us and uses the majority of that money to kill people overseas, um, a government who is run by Donald Trump. Um, you know, a lot of people will say that we need universal health care. And then it's like, OK, well, if we stop talking about the unicorn and start talking about reality, you want Donald Trump to decide if your grandmother can have the operation that she needs. Like, the, let's talk about reality here, you know. And so I think like what John was saying, if you if you look throughout history, the state has never been a force for peace. They have never made people's lives better. Um, I think if you ask people for examples of how the state has done anything beneficial, if they can think of anything, you can usually take it back to, well, the state didn't actually do that. So, yeah, I think it, that's a big thing. We, we have to talk about reality of what the state actually does rather than what we have grown up being told that they should do or the ideal that we believe that it could be because that has never happened in reality. A lot of a lot of these questions are coming from an American government perspective from Christians. But if you look at like China, if you look at the Christians in China and look at what the government's doing to the Christians in China, you know, I know we don't live in China, but that's still government and they're still persecuting Christians daily over there, locking them up for worshiping Jesus. So it, it, it get away from what American Christianity looks like compared to what Chinese Christianity looks like it's different, but there's still government involved. And if you don't think that our government's capable of doing the same thing that China's doing, you're being naive, in my opinion. Yeah. First of all, I really agree with what you just said, that if we take the idea that our government could never be as oppressive as China's government is, that's a hubris on our part, that we believe somehow our government is better. And that's just not the case. There's um, what I had wanted to say actually plays off of that, which is that we have a lot of people who believe in the state who think that it is an innocuous tool and that if we just have the right people leading the state, then things will go the right way. And, um, you know, to bring it back to First Samuel again, they go to great lengths to point out what a, you know, relatively decent person Saul is um, before he's, you know, anointed and becomes king. And it doesn't matter. You can have the absolute best of all humans in that position, and it's still going to be a problem because it's the nature of what you're doing. You're trying to have uh, control over individuals. And that kind of goes back to what Abby says is, you know, we don't want to take individual responsibility. And so we rely on the idea of leaders and the idea of like nations and identities to um, be good for us. Because, um, you know, we don't want to have to accept that personal responsibility of our individual state of goodness. How much are we helping each other? How loving are we? Are we taking care of the poor? Are we taking care of widows and orphans around us? And I think a lot of people who are statist in their nature think, yes, I am doing that because 
the government takes my taxes and then they care for poor people. And you're sort of removing your own personal responsibility. God, God gave that job to you, not to you to pass off to other people. You're not supposed to hire that out. I agree with that. 100 percent that is just the great way to to say it um one of the things i from my perspective you guys might have different ones or people who's listening to this might have some different perspectives but what i see in christianity as a whole american christianity as a whole right now is we're still stuck in a slave mindset and in a sense we're still looking for a physical messiah instead of trusting the one that already came died and resurrected and gave us some instructions and it reminds me of a couple quotes and i consider people prophets that Maybe other Christians want it, but Harriet Tubman, in my opinion, was a prophet. And one of the things that she said that really has spoke to me deeply over the years, I've meditated on this for at least 20 years, is I freed a thousand slaves. And I could have freed a thousand more if they would have known they were slaves. And I see that's that's American Christianity right now, in a sense, where we're, we're not wanting that responsibility, the take up your cross and follow me uh, responsibility. Uh, we don't want that responsibility of speaking to the poor people in jail, the the persecuted, um, the poor that need clothes or food. And like in Matthew 25, when Christ shepherd, separates the sheep and the goats, you know, he, he puts that on the end of that with some pretty harsh language of those who take care of the poor, they go into eternal life and the other ones go into a, a, uh, eternal punishment. And that's some really strong language of how we treat one another. Um, the other prof- prophet <laughs> that I'll probably get disagreed with on um, – is Bob Marley, in my opinion. And in the song, uh, Redemption Song, he says, emancipate yourself from mental slavery. None but yourself can free your mind. And this I wholeheartedly agree with because as an evangelical, I was always stuck in evangelical thinking and to question anything outside of, say, the, what the, the pastor, the denomination, or the Protestant way of thinking was was his heresy. So yeah, if if I'm putting up lines in front of how I can think, then I'm a mental slave to an institution, whether it be a religious one or a state one. And I think it's important. And I think Christ, even the story of Christ, even models that the individual has the responsibility to free themselves at some point. I just want to push back a little bit and not um, maybe for the sake of devil's advocacy. I think often when we get into our uh, own echo chambers, as anti-government types, we tend to speak in absolutes that I think make people question our premises. And so I don't think it's correct to say that we can't find positive outcomes from government or that we can't see uh, government functioning in ways that we want it to when we get to vote and exert whatever power we're told we have. Um, Instead, I think we should be making the argument that whatever means the government has are, are corrupted. And we shouldn't be relying on the government as the tool that Jessica talked about um, to achieve our ultimate ends. Because regardless of whether or not the government does anything positive is sort of beside the point. Um, It's the fact that the way in which they do it and the removal of individual agency and by extension, the Christ-like nature within us and our opportunity to be a light on, on a hilltop I think is what really should be our overarching message to Christians who believe in the state as a a vehicle for good, because ultimately um, it's really not about absolutes or um, trying to compare a monarchistic Christian government to whatever it is that we have today. Rather, it's it's that it robs us of our opportunity to be Christ-like to our neighbors and it really, I think, through the collective sort of mindset that it foists on everybody, it's really done a, a real disservice to Christians amongst other Americans. I, I know we've, uh, we're we all probably aware of how the Christian is viewed in the, the narrative outside of Christian circles and also how people view us on the receiving end of our foreign policy. Uh, I was talking about this with Craig, but it's really hard for uh, Christians or non-Christians in countries that we're bombing to separate our professed Christian nature with what they see as American military hegemony. Um, And those sorts of points, I think, really give the Christian who's doubtful of the anarchist position an opportunity to reflect upon what it is exactly that the Christian nation, um, in quotes, 
is delivering to the world. We end up talking about Jesus Untangled every time I'm on this podcast. But the the big thing that hit me (laughs) when I read Jesus Untangled by Keith Giles is that, I mean, first of all, relying on the government is fear-based, but that comes from a fear of not fully trusting the Holy Spirit. That if we really believe in the power of the Holy Spirit, the power of the government is like laughable compared to the power of the creator of the universe. And I think just what John was saying, like, yeah, maybe we could use the government to do good, or maybe sometimes they have some beneficial outcomes, but that is absolutely nothing compared to if we were fully relying on the power of the Holy Spirit and diving into that, the change that we could make in the world. Yeah, I just couldn't agree with that more. It was hard for me to sit in my chair and just not do a Pentecostal shuffle from side to side. Um, (laughs) But yeah, I mean, I I do want to say the government will do good things at times. And when they do, it's because they're reflecting what they need to be doing is stepping aside or acting in the model of Christ. And sometimes, you know, I have to say, even with atheists that I know that sometimes they behave like Christ more than Christians can. Um, But not to say that their position is cemented that they they have to be there. Um, I just think if more people would just take responsibility on themselves and for themselves and for others, then we don't need this kind of this kind of life system in place, however you want to put it. Okay, let me switch to another uh, comment that was sent to me. And he says, I cannot conceive of any anarchical situation anywhere in the world or the history of humanity that sinful human nature would not cause to quickly descend into a state of severe destruction of all image bearers, but especially of the most vulnerable, which is almost always women, children, and the poor, before some form of civil government was put in place to curb the levels of evil anarchy headed toward. I definitely don't think human civil government is a pre-fall good or even something that is ever free of the significant influence of evil, so I'm open to being wrong on this. But it does seem like government is a form of common grace instituted by God after the flood because of the hardness of human hearts to keep humanity from quickly and completely destroying itself. What say y'all? Well, I would point out that we have a government right now that sanctions the murder of babies who are still in the womb. And so if we're worried about the most vulnerable among us, that certainly qualifies, in my opinion, that these are the absolute most vulnerable human beings. And we have a government that sanctions and protects their murder. So that argument falls a little hollow with me I, I do understand the idea behind it that it would be just absolute total destruction, but I think that you know there still would be Christians, and as was mentioned before, there are atheists who behave just like Christians. We have that strong Judeo-Christian um, philosophy in our culture, and I don't think that removed of a state that sanctions essentially baby murder, that you would have uh, people just devolving into chaos. We have had periods in history, such as the fall of the Roman Empire, where there wasn't uh, states around to control people, and people had to rely on their their faith. And that informed them to create a, basically a new culture and a new society where, for a time, they had Christ at the center of their thinking. And so I don't think that the removal of a Leviathan state is necessarily going to uh, devolve into the destruction of humanity, no more so than we have a state that already destroys humanity now. Yeah. Um, to that question, I would kind of turn that on its head and say, well, if you're concerned about the corrupted nature of man, why would it be more logical to put them in an organization that kind of centralizes their power and allows them to administer uh, more or less unaccountably amongst other people? Because I think it's true that man is corrupted. And I think it's true that we um, have a base of sinful nature that um, makes all of us at least susceptible to terrible things. To think that organizing a government to try to alleviate some of that, I think is is hubristic. And I, I think it kind of flies in the face of what what it is we're being called to do as Christians, which is to um, to love one another and to love God. And I don't think that we can do those things functionally uh, by centralizing the sin that we uh, have innate in us. Um, 
And again, you know, I think that the counter may be that, well, that's supposed to be accountable to people and that kind of gives it a little bit of a check. But the U.S. has been a perfect example of how those checks break down over time and um, how a lot of these ideals that we at least think that the society that we're within is structured on often fall away when push comes to shove, whether it be a financial or um, military crisis or uh, just the slogging of time that sees those principles sort of erode. We've seen just in the American experiment that was supposed to be the smallest government in world history turn into what it is today precisely because of that sinful nature. So I think we're at much, we're much less secure by organizing ourselves in that way than we would be by trying to voluntarily cooperate. I would just say somebody who I really admire is Jeffrey Tucker. And uh, one of his quotes, I can't quote it exactly, but basically anarchy is all around us. Like most of your life is not controlled by the state, like your interactions with your neighbors when you're doing business. I mean, certainly to a certain extent, there are laws regulating that, but say you're in a farmer's market or whatever, like just exchange between people, talking to your neighbors, uh, exchange of ideas, like almost everything you do is not have, you don't have some kind of government official standing over your shoulder with a gun. So I know some people imagine that if we didn't have police or whatever, that everyone would just like start murdering each other and becoming drug addicts. I just don't see any evidence to point to that when I, if you think about your daily life, like we all just exist peacefully most of the time and it's the government agents who are bringing in the violence for the most part getting rid of the state obviously wouldn't get rid of violence and theft but the state is a guarantee that you will have violence and theft that's interesting you said that uh, when the episode that john and i recorded um he mentioned something that i'd never thought of it this way but we live 99 percent of our lives in an anarchist society if you think about it. Yeah. And I had never thought about it because he's right. You know, I mean, we would still have roads if there wasn't government. You know, we would still go to work if there wasn't government. Right. For for the most part, it's in your best interest to live peacefully with the people around you. Right. Whether you're going to go to jail or not. <laughs> uh, yeah. Agree with all of that. And I think the that mindset that we need government, it really comes from a state of fear. And the government also likes to, how do you say, uh, put the pour more gas on that that fire that already exists in, in people, and that's why people are so easily to run to it. Um, I think on a psychological level, I think that is the primary emotion that most uh, human thought comes out of, and and that's one of the things I think that Scripture and Christ came to free us from is not to live in fear, but into perfect love. Um, so, you know, ultimately it does come down to what's in the heart of a person. If it's really fear-based, then they're going to want that person that's taking care of them. Um, but if they can overcome that fear, that's kind of where true love kind of comes in and it, and it takes the position and does the right thing. Yeah, I think that you can look at the nature and history of states and realize that they turn um, the destruction of human life into a, you know, a business and an art form. And I... I think you would be very hard pressed to find individuals who could uh, end human life on the scale that states are able to. Oh, absolutely. Because they are able to, yeah, they're able to marshal the amount of money and uh, manpower and materials that it takes to commit things like genocides. You would never have an individual capable of that kind of thing. Even even if they grouped together, <laughs> um, you just wouldn't be able to marshal that kind of force for the destruction of life that states are able to do. All right. So to another comment that was sent to me, he said, I have read letters from early Christians, Peter, Paul, John, Luke, etc. There's nothing wrong with voting to protect liberty. The Bible tells us God determines and puts the authorities in our lives, not just the atheists. He puts the Christian ones there, too. Now, he didn't say Romans 13, but it, it looks to me like that's where he was alluding to. And a lot of times Romans 13 is brought up. Anybody want to speak on that? Yeah, again, I think it's important to kind of, again, reflect on what it is that we're seeing as the outcome of the state. If we are trying to make the argument that we are given a duty 
to advance whatever it is that the government is doing or just be supportive of the government. I think, A, that's not exactly what the scripture is saying. And I think, B, it would be running completely contrary to what it is our mission as Christians on earth is. Um, the reason that I say that it's not scriptural is because Paul and the early writers in the New Testament, as well as a lot of the uh, writers afterwards, like Tertullian, when they talk about how Christians should be relating to government, it's always in a form of submissiveness so that our rebellion to a given government or our ardent support is not getting in the way of us uh, spreading the gospel and being good neighbors. It's not because the government is supposed to be the, um, the vehicle for change. And if the government were a change agent, just as we talked about earlier, Christ would not have come as uh, some really basic carpenter who was well-spoken and loving. He would have come as a political figure. The reason that he didn't is because politics and governments are never going to be change agents for the kingdom of God. We, as the church, are charged with that. And the role that we are supposed to take to governments is put in scripture, I believe, to remind us that this is a, a body of institutions that will be with us for our entire time that we're here on earth. And we have a duty not to violently rebel against them, but also not to walk hand in hand in the direction that they're going, because they're never going in the same direction that the kingdom of God is going in. One thing that uh, with Romans 13, uh, that if you look at the different definitions between submit and obey, especially in the, in the, in the Greek, there, there's just two different definitions. So you got in Romans 13, it's saying submit. But if you look at Acts 5, Peter says, we're to obey God rather than man. So there's one of two things happening. Either the Bible is contradicting itself or the early church was contradicting itself, or we were misunderstanding what Romans 13 is actually talking about. Uh, yeah, I think what we do wrong with Romans uh, 13 is we'll read it, you know, in the in the context of the book of Romans, but we don't read it within the historical context of what's going on. Um, and there's some translation issues that, you know, we're unsure of. Some translations say higher powers, like the King James Version, uh, which in my opinion is more appropriate than government. Um, but then again, I'm not in the original Greek. But what I see in the historical content is you can't say that Christians can just join government because the early church forbid it. Um, they wouldn't take soldiers. You actually had to step down from your uh, government role if you were trying to become a Christian because they knew that the state did violence where Christ promoted uh, service. So one of the things I think we've lost this far down the line um, from the, the history of this stuff is – they use Christ to compare to Caesar. Caesar behaves this way. Christ behaves this way. Now, I'll go back to Joshua. Choose this day who you are going to serve. Are you going to be like Christ or are you going to be like Caesar? That was the big question of the day. So when Christians today say, hey, we need to get involved with government, they're aligning themselves with the way of Caesar and not with the way of Christ. Well, and John mentioned Tertullian too. And he, if you read some of his writings to the, to the Romans, he he was very clear that they were not interested in joining in on any of their meetings. They didn't want, they don't want anything to do with the Roman empire. They were completely separate from that. I mean, they, they truly believe there was no King, but Christ. And we were, when Abby and I uh, did that episode with Keith Giles, he, he said, I hate to burst your bubble about Tertullian. It was pretty funny. He said, but he was, he was as good as he was on being anti-state his writings about women were horrible. <laughs> so you got to take, you know, but what he's talking about with the state is perfect. So um, two things uh, off of what Scott said, first of all, is that you can't have two masters. It's just impossible to devote your heart entirely to two different masters. So you can have the idea that you are ruled by the state, or you can have the idea that you're ruled by God and Christ. That's, uh, you know, a choice that you would have to make. I think it's impossible to split yourself between them. And then the second point that I wanted to make was that um, through my education on the early church, especially Christianity spreading through the Roman Empire, it seems to me to very much so be partially a women's movement, that there are a lot of women who um, their husbands are converted to Christianity as because of them. And the Emperor Constantine is an example of this. His wife, Bertha, is the reason for his conversion. I mean, there's a story of him seeing, you know, uh, a cross in the sky during a battle. 
But the truth of the matter is, is that his wife was a Christian and it was politically expedient um, as someone who was seeing this cultural movement happen to become Christian as well. And so I see uh, women who found a better place for themselves in Christ in Christianity, as opposed to the role that they had in the Roman Empire, which was basically nothing. So uh, it, although you can look at some early church writings and see a lot of anti-female sentiment there, if you go just a little bit further than that, you peel back that layer, you actually see something of a women's movement, um, a very early version of a women's movement, because their rights were much better uh, with Christianity than they were with the Romans. It actually, it's it's even in a lot in the Old Testament as well. I just, I couldn't stay, stay still in that because there was so much, like that was so, how do you say, out of the cultural norm. Um, but the, the, the writers put so much in there that these women were participating. Like, I mean, the, the ones who supported Christ the most uh, were out of their finances were women. And uh, the story where one of King Herod's, or his, I think it's his treasurer's wife, was supporting Jesus. So here you have basically Herod's money <laughs> supporting the king of kings, <laughs> the one that he's actually against. <laughs> and there's things like that that we just don't pick up on it because uh, this is probably going to maybe get me in trouble. Um, but a lot of people have kept that voice out of the scriptures and don't really put it out there as much. But women played a huge role, huge role. Um, to me, the the mentioning of women or the presence of women in so many stories of the Bible belies its truth to me because – if it were solely the work of human beings, the prevailing culture of those days is there would be nothing but men in the Bible. And there's not. There are quite a lot of women, stories about women, stories about uh, women's issues and the things that we deal with, such as infertility, is a huge issue in the Bible. And it's not something that is necessarily uh, a man's uh, interest. And so I think that it's interesting to point out that in that time, which was very much male slanted and male oriented, you have so many stories about women. And if it were just, you know, human beings in charge of creating that storyline, then it would have been just men. There would be nothing but men in the Bible. And it's not that way. Being new to Christianity, that's something I found very surprising because people will often, you know, from the atheist side, will often try to point out like the, the sexism of the early church or the sexism of uh, the Catholic church through the Middle Ages and even down to our more modern things being like, well, you know, we, we don't want women pastors. And the theology aspect is a little bit above my pay grade. So I don't try to get too heavy into that stuff. But, you know, it's women figure into the story. And to me, that belies the truth of the words. Yeah, just in that vein, it's funny that you mentioned it. I was going to mention uh, Perpetua, yes. who was a famous martyr that was documented. Um, her and her slave went to the lions and um, wild animals of the Colosseum for professing their faith. And when you imagine Romans 13 or the early writings to the church uh, from the early church fathers, you have to remember that this is the world that they were living in, the world that you're concerned we will come to life if uh, we don't have government. It was their understanding that government was the ultimate force against the the church, and they were um, brutal in in cracking down on uh, Christians and and making them sport by uh, being killed brutally in front of all these people. And so, when we talk uh, about Romans thirteen, it's, it's important to understand that submission and our charge from Christ's first teaching in at the Sermon on the Mount about uh, being meek and being peacemakers, it's it's supposed to fall directly in line with those teachings of the Sermon on the Mount by saying, this is how we're supposed to interact as Christians, which is in contrast to how the rest of the world operates, and that is to be meek and to be peacemakers, which cannot be done through um, a belief in the government, again, I, I keep using the term change agent, but to be a change agent for us as individuals, we can't rely on, on that structure when we have, uh, as professing Christians, an alternative that's so much better and requires us to live contrary to the average man. Um, and that requires us sort of eschewing our initial faith in government, whether it be instilled from our parents or in schools or something that we've come to pragmatically. I think it's it's wise to understand Romans 13 uh, in the bloody context that it was written. Yeah, I would just wanted to say also, like, as far as violence, there, 
even though the Old Testament is obviously full of tons of violence, if you look hard, you can find uh, how God is calling them to be peaceful. And that's been a big change in how I've read the Bible recently is looking for the things, trying to understand the cultural context that the books were written in, um, and then looking for the things that were countercultural. Um, I think that's where you find a lot of really amazing truths and and how God was trying to speak to people and and break through their culture and lead them to a different way. Um, and like when Jesus came breaking down nationalistic barriers, breaking down barriers between slave and free, male and female, all of that, I think it's it's so awesome to read the Bible and notice all of those things in there. I, I want to say the Bible is hugely subversive, and when we're trying to read it just as a rule book, we miss that. It's un it's undoing a lot of the things that's already been done. Um, and so to close it up, I do want to touch on the Christian anarchism thing. I can't really separate them. Mm -hmm. And we're trying to sometimes say that, you know, I want to keep this more Christian than anarchist. I don't think we can. I think these are, these are hand in hand. Um, because if you're loving your neighbor as yourself, you're not going to, you're not going to try to rule over them. You're going to try to serve them. Um, and that's kind of the, the, NA, the NAP right there. If, if all you can do is just not harm somebody, at least do that. Yeah, that's true. I mean, I, I spent a lot of time in Southern Baptist churches and one of the things they talk about is they didn't really, they didn't let women teach a lot, you know, and at the time, you, I think you said something about earlier, Scott, about not questioning what the pastor's talking about. And I think we need to start questioning, not, not just the government. We need to start questioning the church as well, you know, and how, how they're portraying Christ and how they're uh, portraying Christianity in itself. I think that's our, that's our, our duty, you know, there's false teachers all over the place. Yeah. And everybody's human too. You know, <laughs> it's not like your pastor can't make a mistake or they have perfect theology. Nobody has perfect theology. I'm not, uh, some of the, the theology stuff goes way over my head and I just try to stay out of it. It doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't resonate with me very, very well at all. I've just gotten to the point now that I'm just going to try to live like Jesus instructed me and then do the best I can. It's a, that's a lot. Yeah. I like, I try to, simplify things that way because when you get into the theological debates i just i don't know i was just gonna bring up um the examples of martyrdom that we see with the early christians or like you mentioned what's going on in china right now with um, them persecuting the church like governments are well aware that people cannot be devoted to them and to god that it, that those things contrast each other the interesting thing that we see in the United States is that the government hasn't had to forcefully make people worship the state, basically, rather than government, because people choose to do that here voluntarily. And people bristle when you say that. But if you really pay attention to how reverent we are of the flag, you have to treat the flag a certain way. Like people will really go nuts if you don't treat the flag respectfully or um, when the NFL players were kneeling for the national anthem, like that is our song of worship to the state, and you have to act a certain way when that song is played, or you will be ostracized by society. Like things like this that we see all around us, it it's so much of a more subtle way, but in our culture, we've gotten to this place where people willfully choose to worship the state and put God second. Whereas governments that impose that more violently, they get the resistance to it. But when it's kind of done with this cultural indoctrination, people just do it willingly. Uh, Abby just said something brilliant there. Um, and it reminded me of a piece I just read the other day by Danny Surgeon, who's a search. I don't know if I'm saying his name right. Um, he's an anti-war veteran from Iraq. And uh, his piece, The Unaccountable Nation, is at antiwar.com. And he talks about the stages of how a government sort of falls into the trap that we find ourselves in now, where we're so, so chauvinistic and uh, we have this belief of self-righteousness that fuels so much of our policy. And I think it's a reminder that it, these, these nations that believe that they themselves are exceptional and then their people believe that they're exceptional, it tricks Christians, Christian Americans, into believing that they're belief in government or the policies that they choose to support are themselves righteous because this great nation is doing it. It can't possibly be bad to um, put sanctions on Yemen 
while they flounder in an untenable medical situation where they can't get basic medical care because it's the U.S. doing it. Um, and it's our leaders who we duly elected that do it. It can't possibly be wrong. And I think it's a real condemnation of the Christian church in America that the U.S. government doesn't view us as a threat because had they viewed us as a threat or if they believed that the Christian government didn't agree so wholeheartedly with their policies, we would see the sort of um, the sort of crackdowns that they saw in the Roman government. And it's it's an opportunity for us to say that maybe we've fallen short in our charge as Christians if the U.S. government doesn't view us as the threat they probably should, because we are so happy to to get in line with the policies that we see playing out right now. Um, yeah, one of the things I think that our role as the church is um, is we have to be that descending voice to to power. You know, and the prophets um, they were basically that challenge to authority um, that if they were behaving correctly or not. When you look at the Old Testament, uh, they weren't really in line with one another. Um, it's basically was calling them to repentance, and that's kind of what our, we should be doing. And what really frustrates me with the church is you have, and I'll pick out some leaders. Uh, what's his name? Franklin Graham and Jerry Falwell Jr. These these guys are so embedded in the state. I can't I can't even myself call them Christian. Um, they're willing to back up like Trump or whoever they're aligned with, one hundred percent. And what we are supposed to be doing is taking care of the widows and orphans um, and calling those in power to. To, to behave correctly. And when we have, I'll say the majority of the, the Christian right and 100% supporting the government, whatever it does, the church has lost its power that way. And that's just my opinion. Yeah, I think there are a lot of people who will kind of put out the idea that, uh, well, God places our leaders in charge. And well, I do certainly uh, know that the hand of God plays a role in the smallest of things and the largest of things. Um, it might not be for the purpose that you think. It might be that Donald Trump is president because it makes just enough people realize that the state, not the way to go. And think about how many people became disillusioned through the Barack Obama presidency. And then Donald Trump came in there like a, you know, absolute stick of dynamite to blow things up and made people go, oh, okay, maybe putting human beings in charge of these things and in charge of our lives is not the way to go. So yeah, I, I do see that there is the hand of God in that, and but it might not be for the purpose you think. It might not be uh, this leader is anointed by God as the good leader. Maybe it's to make people see the fallacy of the state. You know, you don't know uh, the quiet ways that might be working on your psyche. Yeah, it's funny you said that because in, when, when, when Obama was elected, I was still hardcore uh, Republican, I, I made a comment. I said, you know, maybe God puts people in power just to teach us a lesson. And it was just because I was mad that Obama got elected, you know, but that was just me being an idiot back then. But I think maybe, maybe there is something to that though. Maybe he does put people, maybe some of these people are allowed to be put in power to kind of teach Christians a lesson. Now Christians just need to kind of wake up to what God's trying to tell us. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to get really snarky on that one. Um, I think we have people in power because we're not willing to step up and take responsibility for ourselves. Hands down. Yeah, I think there's a lot of truth to that. Yeah. I just would I, I, I just would say that I think that because things have been in such upheaval in the American government, things have not been status quo. It's given people an opportunity to uh, have conversations that they with people they wouldn't have ordinarily had conversations with and maybe to realize some things that if things had just been going along swimmingly and smoothly, they would have never really had the wherewithal to look elsewhere, look at other philosophies and say, hey, are we really moving in the right direction? So even when things are in a state of upheaval, you have to have a little bit of gratitude for that to say, hey, at least it's making people wake up. And I certainly hope that's the case. I've noticed that some, you know, just messages that I get from people that aren't really on board with, with the whole anarchist or Christian anarchist idea, but they have, they're interested in it because it's not normal compared to what we're used to and what we're, what we're actually talking about makes sense to people. It's just, there's, there's a fear factor involved that, that keeps people from getting on board completely. So uh, I think this was a lot of fun. Uh, Jessica, go ahead and plug your show and your blog. Oh yeah. So I have a YouTube channel the Jessica Green Show. You can also find uh, audio episodes on pretty much any podcaster. 
And I have a blog, The Libertarian Kitchen Witch at uh, Word WordPress. That's mainly oriented at like prepping and recipes and those kinds of things. But I occasionally have a little political rant on there too. So check me out. Awesome. John? Yeah, as I mentioned before, I um, manage a blog called Anti-War War Vet and uh, primarily an Instagram page that links to a Facebook group. But um, I'm just getting started trying to post original content and get the message out, try to be um, a voice amongst veterans for anti-war issues and trying to expose the villainy of the state to people who are often so predisposed to believing in it. Yes, I I don't know if y'all had a chance to read John's uh, articles for antiwar.com. They're excellent. Uh, when he first reached out to to help with our blog for the Bad Roman, he, he sent me some stuff and I read it. I was like, yeah, we got to get this guy on board. He's He's pretty good at what he's doing. And Abby and Scott both writing for the Bad Roman have had some excellent articles as well. But I'm going to close it up there. And if anybody wants to send us a topic to talk on the next round table, send it to the Bad Roman podcast at gmail.com or through our website. And we will do this again. This has been a lot of fun. I appreciate everybody being on board. Thanks for joining us this week on the Bad Roman Podcast. Be sure to subscribe to the show wherever you find your podcasts to never miss an episode. And while you're at it, if you like what you heard, we'd appreciate a rating on iTunes. Or if you'd simply tell a friend about the show, it really helps people find us. 100% of donations are given to local charities in Memphis, Tennessee. To learn more about the Bad Roman Project and to find show notes, please visit thebadroman.com. Until next time, remember, sometimes being a good Christian means being a bad Roman.